Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian from the Association of the United States Army's Conference and Trade Show in Washington, D.C. And we have with us Dr. Paul Rogers, who is the director of the Tank Automotive Research Development and Engineering Center in uh, Michigan. And we've also got Charlie Fries, who is uh, the executive director of Hybrid Power at General Motors. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Vago. Um, Paul, I want to start with you. Tell us a little bit, you know, this is, uh, you know, the Army has long had a bunch of cooperative research and engineering uh, and development contracts with a number of companies, General Motors being one of them. Um, Army has always been interested in novel power sources since the, the, the transfer of uh, technology from the horse and the mule over to uh, vehicles. What are you guys trying to achieve with this vehicle and this partnership you have with General Motors? Why is hybrid and specifically fuel cell power so attractive to you? Well, I think the defining word for this uh, collaboration is potential. So there's a great potential in this technology. It has certain attributes that are very attractive for the military. Silent mobility is number one. Uh, exportable power is number two. And then there's also the uh, byproduct of fuel cell technologies, which is water. And on the battlefield, we spend a great deal of time and effort transporting fuel and water on the battlefield this technology has the potential of mitigating some of those transportation needs and sustainment needs. So we are looking at the potential of this technology from that those perspectives. And, uh, and for the, over the next year, we're going to be doing technical evaluation plus soldier user evaluation to understand the business case, how, you, how this could be utilized for our, our war fighters, and then uh, how we can distribute, de develop, distribute, and store hydrogen on the battlefield. So we're going to be a couple fold. Uh, one is experimenting with this vehicle, but the other one is studying the entire business case of how this can be implemented in our, our uh, operating environment. Charlie, I want to bring you into this. Talk to us a little bit about it. I mean, this vehicle, normally your product cycles go in about five year cycles for commercial vehicles. You guys did this in an extraordinary year. Tell us a little bit about what you guys had to do to get this vehicle, which is a modified Colorado uh, truck, to, to get it ready, and when are you going to deliver it for testing? Yeah, so, so this, this vehicle for us is all about uh, mobility, efficiency, and utility. And really what we did was we got the mobility out of the Colorado. So the Colorado already had the capability for off-road. We put a little bit bigger tires on this. It's got a 37-inch tire. Uh, some minor, minor modifications on the vehicle allow us to fit the tires. So that gave us that ability to get the mo mobility. The fuel cell technology we've been developing for years. And, I mean, actually 50 years is how long we've been working on fuel cells. So we took the technology, and it, it was already something we were looking looking at for these types of vehicles and, and looking at how is the synergy between the technology, the propulsion system, and the off-road capability, the mobility of the vehicle merged together. And so we, we took a, an off-the-shelf capability there, put it into the vehicle, and then uh, we're demonstrating the utility because, uh, as, as Dr. Rogers said, a lot of the things that come out of the fuel cell, almost as byproducts, are actually advantageous when we talk about an off-road environment. So think about something where we have great zero uh, or torque across the entire speed range from zero speed all the way up to the maximum speed of the vehicle, the electric drive system can deliver that. So coupling those technologies together, uh, we went through and really quickly reached into the parts bin and we were able to build up a vehicle that can do what this vehicle is capable of demonstrating. And, and it has a terrific fit and finish to it, by the way. If you slam the doors and slam the hood, you just want to keep you want to you want to record this hood slamming over and over again and actually put it on your cell phone. But um, uh, Dr. Rogers, uh, you know, you, you mentioned a little bit about the infrastructure required for it, right? We have a, a fuel infrastructure, whether it's for gasoline or for diesel, that's very, very well established. Um, and, and when folks hear hydrogen, unfortunately, the first thing they think of is, is the Hindenburg highly flammable gas. What are the advantages of hydrogen, but also what are the, the challenges as well as the myths that are associated with it? I think the exact answers to those two questions are going to be defined over this next year. So we, in parallel with the experimentation I mentioned, we're going to be working on workshops to look at, again, uh, our means of developing hydrogen, storing, and then dispensing the hydrogen. So we're going to get a lot of those answers as we explore the potential of this technology. Uh, but, you know, one of the very attractive things, uh, I've already mentioned that uh, moving fuel on the, the battlefield is a very uh, um, demanding process. So. Uh, with a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, we have other sources of a hydrogen to use other than hydrocarbon fuels. So we may be able to extract it out of water. We may be able to extract it out of natural gas reserves 
in the theater that we're operating in. And there's other sources. So uh, we have a lot of uh, ideas to explore. We're going to be leveraging the whole of government and industry to bring them together in these workshops to truly get an understanding of what's possible. And then that allows us to tailor solutions for the theaters that we find ourselves fighting in, whether it's a very sophisticated theater with a lot of infrastructure or a very austere theater. So there's a lot of potential here, and it's really about trying to explore that full potential and understand it and then be able to apply it in a purposeful way for our benefits. Uh, but how do you address you know, the concern that people always have when they do think about hydrogen? They think of a very, very explosive gas, um, obviously, Gasoline is, is very, you know, any fuel under pressure particularly is, is dangerous. You guys are also interested in vehicle safety and crew safety. What are some of the challenges and the mitigations that are necessary with something, for example, like hydrogen in a vehicle? Well, that's what's great about this partnership. So uh, General Motors has been investing a great deal of time and effort into the safety of their product. And they've been experimenting and looking at how to safely implement this into a passenger vehicle in the hazards that you would find on a common road application. So that's already a body of knowledge that we're leveraging. And what we're going to be look doing is building upon that body of knowledge and looking at the specific military environmental impacts, such as blasts, larger ballistic events, to build off of that knowledge into a more uh, military relevant environment. So we will be leveraging that and building upon it but first, we're going to be uh, understanding the full benefits right. of the vehicle system itself. I, I hope and that this... I think Charlie can speak to what General Motors has done, extensive work on the safety of uh, this system. I, I would hate to see a car as lovely as this actually get shot up. But, uh, Charlie, tell us a little bit. You know, you guys, you know, you did say you've been working on this technology for, for 50 years. You're somebody who's overseeing all power hybrid applications for fuel cells for, um, uh, for uh, General Motors. Um, talk to us a little bit about the virtuous commercial defense cycle that we're seeing here as you guys work to refine and advance the technology. Where are we going to be in the commercial marketplace with this technology, for example, in five years? Well, we, we continue to develop the technology moving down the cost curve. And so there are two things that have to happen. One is you have to have the cycles of learning, and we continue to push through those. And then the other is that we have to have scale. And so we've been continuing to move down the scale path in terms of how we've designed the system, leveraging technologies that are already off the shelf in other applications. As we've grown our, our electrification portfolio, we've been able to use some of those technologies for a vehicle like this. But we've also really, really been able to push that fuel cell technology. So this vehicle is using one of our older systems, um, but it, uh, we've gone clearly down a path of, of minimization in size, mass, and cost. And so now we can develop systems that are actually mu less than half the size of what's in this vehicle. Uh, we've taken the cost out through a, a, a myriad of ways. One thing that we did was we took the, uh, the precious metal, which is the platinum, from 80 grams down to now the systems we're developing are actually less than 12. And the platinum is one key cost driver in the system. And it, we've taken that right out of the leading list of, of cost drivers. Um, other things like the, uh, the, the uh, bipolar plate, which is in there, we're using technologies where it's made in ways that like conventional automotive, where it's a stamping, like a head gasket. So that's, a, that's one way to start through design iterations and learning. We can take cost out. But the next piece is to go in and think about how do you get scale? And so by taking a, 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 a new approach to the design, we can stack these cells up. Each stack is about a half a horsepower. So by stacking them up, we can get to the horsepower level requirement of the vehicle. And if you have an application that requires less, we can use a smaller stack. When we talk about military, this, this same system that's in this vehicle is similar to the one we're developing with the Navy that goes into an unmanned undersea vehicle. So it's th this idea of reuse. You can get scale in a lot of different ways. And if we can take that same technology and those same parts out of the parts bin and apply them to a Navy application of an unmanned submarine, then you can get more scale capability. And then you can start thinking about other things, you know, mobile generators, auxiliary power units, even aircraft power. And it all comes out of reusing what's already being developed and getting scale. Is, um, is a fuel cell really the most attractive ultimate hybrid power source? And if so, why? Well, we always say there's no single silver bullet. Um, you know, different applications have different needs. And so if you live, uh, I'm going to talk about the, the typical customer in a GM environment of a, a civilian customer. If you're in a city and you've got access to recharging sites and you rel have relatively small vehicles that are traveling short distances and uh, they can afford to charge for a period of hours, um, that can be a very efficient powertrain, about 93% efficient. But when you start thinking about vehicles that are going longer distances and need to refuel quickly or have, you know, just 
just the utility of a larger vehicle where you can scale it up, hydrogen is a very, very efficient way of putting high density energy on board the vehicle. And that's one of the things that we've been, we've been optimizing through our program. And uh, I can refuel the vehicle in three minutes, and I can get the full 400, 300 to 400 mile range by doing it in the three minute period. And that's, that's a very valuable attribute that can come out of a fuel cell technology. Plus, it is very efficient. It's more than twice as efficient as an internal combustion engine. So when you couple those, um, I'm not going to try to say it's the right thing for everybody, but when you talk about an application like we're talking about here, it's a very attractive option. And let me ask you about the safety question. Dr. Rogers uh, said that you guys had been working on it. Obviously, from a consumer standpoint, you know, what are some of the things that you've done to make sure that, that this um, technology, this system, and then the infrastructure that go goes with it is something that is reliable, safe, and thought-free from the consumer standpoint? Well, so hydrogen is, is a different type of storing energy, right? Anytime you put a fuel on board and hydrogen, I, I think of it as an energy storage m media, but it's actually also a combustible fuel. You have to treat it with respect. And so the advantage we have here is we're dealing with two types of energy. One is the chemical energy, and the other is the, the potential energy of having pressurized gas on board. The chemical energy, we only have the equivalent of about five to eight gallons of gasoline on board, and that's because the system is so efficient, you don't need much more than that. But the other side of it is the compressed the potential energy of the compressed gas, because we are putting the, it on board at 700 bar or 10,000 PSI. And so the tanks themselves are designed to be very, very robust. They're actually a, it's a plastic li uh, liner on the inside, and it's wrapped with a thick band of carbon fiber. And one of the tests that we use for this is we actually fire a 50 caliber projectile at it, which bounces off. It does not penetrate the tank. So that's how strong these are. I mean, actually, the, the prototype that's sitting back here, we went through 38 Sawzall blades to cut the section out so you could look inside it. You know, these are very, very strong. And they're strongest when they're at pressure. And so the o other thing you have to deal with is what happens if it's actually, let's say there's a building burning around the vehicle. What happens? Well, you have to relieve the pressure. So we've designed systems on board that are able to do that so we, we can vent the, the hydrogen. And it actually is a, a very, it has very interesting qualities. It goes up, up straight up at about 45 miles per hour once it escapes. And it's actually hard to get a combustible mixture. Um, one of the tests we did was actually we put a mylar balloon with a perfect stoichiometric mixture of hydrogen and oxygen inside and ignited it. And you get a little flame front, which quickly goes out of stoichiometric. It extinguishes itself, and the balloon doesn't even pop. So, you know, when you talked about Hindenburg, um, you know, actually the Hindenburg was the mylar and the paint on the outside. The hydrogen was pretty much gone. That was not a hydrogen explosion. And that's what people like to think because they know what was inside originally. But um, actually, it's a pretty hard thing to get that kind of a combustion event happening with hydrogen in a, in a balloon. Um, and that's the kind of hard science that we're doing on this show to actually explain to you why and when what exactly happened to the Hindenburg. I want to bring this full, uh, full circle, sir, uh, to you. Is that, as Charlie said, that that pretty much, you know, the the equivalent of eight gallons of this allows you to get 400 miles? Is that why this is so attractive to the Army that you need significantly less fuel, significantly fewer vehicles and fuel trucks or whatever, in order to power an equivalent number of vehicles? It's one aspect of it, but really the silent mobility is key, the exportable power and the production of water as a byproduct. That's kind of the initial uh, offerings that we see here. But the holistic picture and the impacts are what we're really going to be studying over this next year. And I think you know we're wide open to understand where this is going and then how we would implement it over time into our formation our, our, uh, with our operators, our men and women in uniform, so that they can reap the full benefits of such a system. Uh, you know, Charlie talked at length about the infrastructure and, and the uh, issues there. When we go into a theater of operation, we bring our infrastructure with us in many cases. Now, if it's a very uh, well-developed uh, infrastructure and we can leverage what's there, then we leverage it. But largely, we are bringing our infrastructure with us. So something like this, if we understand how to implement it properly, can be very advantageous to men and women in uniform. And one last question. From a maintenance standpoint, these vehicles would mark a significant decrease in maintenance, wouldn't they, compared to regular internal combustion engines? You know, from my standpoint, there's a lot fewer moving parts. So I, to me, there should be a lot lower maintenance requirement for it. But I think General Motors and Charlie has direct experience with that, and they can probably speak from their standpoint. Yeah, 
And we've had similar systems in real customers' hands for over 3.1 million miles. And the nice thing is, in terms of plan maintenance, I mean, there is no oil to change. There's uh, Periodically, you'll, you'll change filters or things like that, but you're not changing oil, you're not having to tune it up. It basically runs for the life of the vehicle. So we're designing it for full useful life. So 15 years of life and uh, 180,000 miles. I mean, we're not going to compromise the vehicle because of the technology. Gentlemen, thanks very much. Best of luck. And you have the one of the coolest vehicles here. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you, Thank you very much.